Yeah. Okay. So um, today we are going to talk about sparse matrix. So sparse matrices are essentially, in data science use matrices. So essentially they are, you know, numbers, one, two, three, four, so on. Many kinds of uh, large data sets. Maybe these are IDs. Uh, you know, these are item IDs. Think about it as like a recommendation system. Suppose you are a data scientist and you went to a job uh, and in your job, you are told that you need to build a recommendation system. What recommendation system is, uh, let's think about an example of uh, Nike. Nike has like several thousands, like 20, to 30,000 kinds of different products. Right. And then customers. Customers could be several million. Let's say we take 1 million. Yeah, 1 million of these customers. So now what they do is that they want to find out some similarities among customers so that they can project the right brand to the right people. Here is an example. So the matrix might look like this. Customer one, customer two, and so on. Customer one million to say. 10 to the six, right? And these are Nike's products or items, I call it. One, two, how many did we say? 20,000 of them. Now, suppose you have some information about these customers because you always have customer profiles. When you use credit card or you open an account, so you always have customer profiles. So you, what you have is that this inventory, how many items, uh, customer one, for example, how many of item two has it consumed? Say five, three, four, and so on. This is a huge matrix of 20,000 columns and one million rows. That is now, <laughs> Say you consume none of item one, it's zero, zero. Item four is six. Similarly, there is another customer, maybe wherever there is, zero, most of them are zero, and it consumes some other 10, 10 15, and so of these, of these columns. So you get the idea. Any question from this? How I'm representing this consumers, uh, we, you know, inventory or the pattern of consumption. Okay. So now the idea is that of recommendation system, what is popular is designing for data science to met methods. They say that suppose customer one is a avid hiker. So he likes to wear hiking shoes. Uh, a customer say 10. So say customer 21 also is a hiker. Right, or, uh, and he might have, it's quite likely that they will go for a brand that has to do with hiking. Or, you know, like maybe he also bought five pairs, you know, three pairs of these shoes and something else. So depending on the customer's profile, there are certain similarities in patterns of consumption. For example, someone who never hikes is very unlikely to buy hiking, you know, items that are related to hiking. So they don't care about it. So uh, now, given this whole list of numbers, you need to find out that these customers are similar. Now you have to define what is the meaning of similarity of customers? What is the meaning of similarity of items? And this similarity is defined by, often by their maybe consumption pattern from this, data that is collected over time. Maybe you have collected over five years 
or two years. And then they will suggest what, from there, who, what customers to recommend other brands he has not consumed. Maybe you might, there is a hiker on the right here or runner. Maybe you can see his similarity of his profiles with other runners and other runners have like certain items. So then it makes sense somehow to Uh, item to that customer and you have to do a lot of analysis and calculations to figure that out otherwise you another alternative is that you can market everything to everyone but that's going to cost you a lot of resource and these are not these are in fact a lot of times spam becomes spam if wrong thing goes to the wrong person then it is going to become treated like a spam so in marketing they use these techniques and there is a huge demand for now in the market for you to go ahead and go in as a data scientist and design, put together these kind of infrastructures. Uh, because it's not like you do this model one time and done. No, you have to keep changing these models based on market behavior. For example, what if you have this consumer behavior and it's pretty old, you need to update it with more recent information, but you cannot still throw away the old information. And maybe there are data that are missing, or maybe there are, there are some corrupt data. So those are some of the problems people try to solve in um, recommendation systems. Uh, any questions? <clears throat> so when you say that recommendation system, can it be for more than uh, you know, one parameters? Like, uh, let's say I may like in a store, probably let's say, let's say for a retail shop, you know, where customers may like uh, shoe, t-shirts, or some other different products. So when, you, when does the recommendation happens? Can it extend to more than multiple, more than one dimension, basically? Right, so um, that is a good question. So the recommendation is essentially generated. Suppose some customer C, customer C, so my goal is to be able to rank them that item 12, 19, 17, and so on. So you have to come up with a metric of preference or ranking. So I might, for each customer, I might be able to, I may have to generate many, many recommendations. Uh, did I answer your question, Neil? Yes. Okay. So, and these calculations, for example, Nike, I know because I help someone out directly. Um, they generate these calculations very regularly and they need to compute for each million customers, several products. But now there are other aspects also. There must be a reason why you uh, recommend someone, uh, some product, specific product. And this is, you need to be able to explain. So that brings us to another kind of problem in recommendation system. How do you explain why you ended up making that decision? And that's useful for business analysis. So that's uh, something um, people do in recommendation systems. These are, there are many recommendation systems problems and we'll do one of these. Uh, but before we get there, we will build up some background. Look at this matrix, the size of this matrix. How many elements are there? So how many numbers are there? So you have N rows is the number of customers times N columns, right? So essentially you are talking about 10 to the power six, 1 million times two 10 to the power four. So, two times 10 to the power uh, 10. Okay, that is great. Two times 10 to the power you know, 10. So, this is like several GB times. Each number is a floating point number. And this might take, say, um, say four bytes. Four bytes, eight. 
six. Oh, this is ten. This is uh, you know eight times. Say, that's a huge number. That's a, like a several GB. Third, you know, it could be like a more than eighty GB. So if you load this matrix, this is just one matrix, and you load in the memory, you won't be able to calculate that. So now, all of these recommendation systems rely on these calculations using these matrices, not just one or two, 30, 40 matrices of this sort, or thousands sometimes, then definitely you are going, it's going to be several terabytes of RAM is going to consume. So then you cannot do this calculation because it doesn't even fit in, a, in the RAM. Your system is either going to be very slow, even if you have a lot of, um, even if you're on a 64-bit machine, uh, but it's not going to work. So what is the way around it now? Not only that, these matrices, you need to do operations. These are say, so it has say, it, these are M times N, many number of rows, millions, and that could be several thousand, hundred thousand to millions. And you want to do operations there, matrix multiplication. B is another, and you are trying to do multiplication. So that is going to cost uh, a lot of time and um, computing power. So what is the way around? The solution is that, does anybody have any idea how we can get around this problem? And this is a very, very common problem. And this is one of the things what I'm going to tell you about is going to be helpful in your job interview. And this is a topic you should actually write down that I know this. I'm going to name that. But in the meantime, does anyone have any idea? So the solution is called sparse matrix. Sparse matrix representations in the So with this, I want to say that today's class, we are going to see a lot of things. And we are going to learn a lot of interesting things today. So we'll go step by step slowly. Um, and there, there will be all knit together, but very different interesting things. Um, so sparse matrix, so look at this matrix. I had this problem of storing eight to the power 10, bytes. That's the problem I have. That's the size of my matrix. Say. Now let's look at it again. Really there are each customer, how many customers can you find who would consume like 20,000 brands from Nikes? Very rare, right? At most you will consume 10, 15, 20, if you are too much into it, 30 maybe, not more than that. You are not going to try all 20,000 spare shoes. So essentially, on an average here, each row, you will have say, let's say, just to pick a number, 10. You will also have at most 10, 20, 15, say, so on. Most of them are zero. Is there any way I can actually store information of these numbers? not zeros. So then probably anything that I don't have a value, I can say that's a zero. That's why I didn't use it. So these, because these matrices where most of the elements are zero are called sparse matrix. Only this part, ignore this for now. This is called sparse. And this is something you should be aware of. Then comes when you want to implement program, you have to deal with it. Being sparse doesn't help you anything. Your goal is to make your life easier with your computer. So the programming techniques or data structure we use, that is called representations. And we are specifically interested in Python based, there it's called sparse matrices, representations. Uh, Sparse matrix matrix 
where do we do that? We will use a library in Python, Python library called SciPy. The SciPy module has several search sparse matrix representation data structures. Give me a second. Uh, there are several types of data structures for storing sparse matrices, and each of them have their advantages and disadvantages. And that's what we are going to focus. Then we are also going to show you how to do create your own format if you want to, or I don't think you will need to, but suppose you wanted to create something that makes your life easier in your calculation, how to redefine certain operations. And then I'm going to show you how do you speed up your Python program. Maybe you can write in, do something. Then I'm going to show you compare the speed of different programs. That is with time. Then I'm going to tell you how do you actually measure complexity, the big O notation in computer science. And, and we'll run some tests. Any questions so far? So what I'm going to do now is go to the, I'll share my screen. First, I will tell you how sparse matrices work. We will go one by one. Specifically, I will focus on, there will be seven types of sparse matrices. I will focus on three main. I will introduce the other four, but for now they are not important and we'll use it later in the class. Um, it is not important to learn all the different types of sparse matrices in one class without an application. Otherwise, it, it will not be useful to you. So you should internalize each one of them. And, uh, and, and specifically, we'll be focused on three. This is called coordinate form, CSR. CSC. I'll explain this, what it means. And I'll also show you how to measure memory. Okay, so let's go over to our computer uh, screen. Any questions so far? Okay, so there is a future of the world. Right, everybody can see. Now I want to show you one thing that, so we are going to do actually sparse matrix representation in the SciPy. As I explained earlier, SciPy is the most popular, you know, the, Python library for today's data scientists in scientific computation. So there are seven types of them. So BSR, block sparse matrix, coordinate form matrix, compressed sparse column matrix, row based matrix, then diagonal storage matrix, dictionary based, and row based linked list based. Of these, we care for now, today's class, these three and they are very important and interconnected. All right. Uh, let me make sure, all right, okay. So now, um, what we want to do is that I want to generate a matrix for now. What do I need to do? So I have to make sure that I have NumPy on my machine, and then I want to explain um, you know, so you always have to, as we have been doing for some time. Uh, Neil, can you see my screen clearly? Yes, it's clear. Uh, can you just enlarge it a little bit? Okay. What about this? Better uh, or? Yeah, no, 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 the previous was better. I think you probably just need to maximize it. What about this? It's too big. Uh, yeah, this is good actually. And I hope everyone is fine with this. 
let me, okay. What yeah, about this one is better. Yeah, this one is better. Okay, great. So then, as you know, you have to import NumPy. Otherwise, you can't do anything. So import NumPy as NP, as we like to do always. So now I'm going to also use a kind of, um, I want to use some random numbers. I want to create some random uh, matrices of random numbers. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to get a random number generator. So where do I find it? So there is one in SciPy uh, from SciPy. There is a stats module, sub module called import uniform. I can use any of the ones that we have used before, but it's uh, good that I use different things so that you get, yeah. so I have this. Now it's time for me to use that to create a random number generator. So random number generator, as we discussed, we used seed last time. So we'll use a seed so that, actually it's not required, do not worry about it. So I'm going to generate a bunch of data. So I'm taking my random number generator uni uniform here, and I'm going to use it here. Random value, I'm going to generate, and I'm going to generate, say, size 16 numbers and I want them between zero and say scale means two. That's all I want. Okay, let's see how do they look. So you got a bunch of numbers between zero and two, 16 of them. What I want is a four by four matrix four rows and four columns. So now the way to transform that, create a matrix like this, we did last time, is that reshape it. Let me explain that again carefully. If you have forgotten, um, what is reshaping? Say I have 12 numbers of um, 3, 2, 4, 7, 6, 8, 9, 10, 14, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. One. 12 numbers I have here. 12 numbers. The random number generator, actually we did actually 16. Here let's assume 12, should put comma. And the random number gave me in an array. So it's an array. I would like, in fact, because it's a 12 numbers, I would like a matrix of three times four. That means I want three rows and four columns, four columns here. The way I want, there is an easy function. Of course, you can put these numbers any way you want in a very complex way, but that would need more work. You can do it, but an easy way, what I want to say is that, hey, the first, because it has four columns and three rows, in the first row I want here, two, four, six, eight. Then these four should be in the second, nine, 13, 14, 17. Okay, so I have the third one. So one, two, three. So then I have 21, two, three, and one. This one. So when you have an array, I would like to have a function that automatically does it and that is called reshape. But if you have like 
another uh, 13 elements and you want to do reshape, you might be in trouble. It would be undefined. Maybe it will ignore the last value or it might give you an error. But this dimension has to match up and this is how it works. So um, now I'm going to rerun that code because I'm using a random number generator. It's going to give me another set of numbers. Isn't that annoying? So that's why I need a seed so that I can freeze it, reproduce it so that you can um, see that see me repeating. Otherwise, it, every time it will be different numbers. But that's fine for now, we'll live with it. Any questions on this? All right. So let's go and share our screen again. Uh, Okay, so here is our data and I want to reshape it. So what I'm going to do is that first let's print the data so that you want to see that. Print the data, which is an array. I will call it raw data. Then I'm going to do a regular matrix. I, STD means standard. Standard matrix I'm going to create. And how am I going to get the reshape function? Well, it is a part of NumPy. So NP reshape, reshape, and reshape what? Reshape, well, data. And how? You have to give two numbers. Here, I have 16 numbers. So I'm going to do four by four. This is how I reshape. And then I'm printing it out. Let's see how it looks. Ah, so raw numbers, I should say, matrix. There you go. So you saw the first four numbers here is the same as here. Then the next subsequent four numbers, you will see it here. This is four by four. Could I have, could I have done something else too with this data? Well, I could have. Uh, now, again, I want to fix the random seed. You see, if I run it again, you'll see different number. Focus on this. This is 0.71. This is something else. That's annoying. Thank you, Shuri. Yeah, go ahead, Rupesh. Uh, Saurabh. Oh, Saurabh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, so for this uniform the RVS, what is the RVS function? Is, uh, ah, I see. Does it have a Yes. Full form something. So RVS, um, I don't remember the full form. So it is, it creates a random values, which scale random values. It's, so uniform is a distribution here between zero and two. So that's uniform. And this RVS function returns you a set of numbers, if you ask him. And you have to provide how many you want, which is size. Did it explain? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so that's what it is. So, so now, observe this. It is annoying, right? I got, I hit, you know, shift, enter, and every time I do, I keep changing. It's very hard to discuss or pinpoint. This is where I remember last time, Saurav asked me a long time ago, why do we need random seed? Now let's see. equal to say five. So there was an error because of typo here. Now I'm going to hit again. See, every time it's the same. It's much easier to talk about it or analyze. But before that, I want to explain, you think this is an array and you are used to talking about arrays. These are the basic structures, but the Python arrays, or the ones that come out of uniform, these are NumPy arrays. They, have, they are a lot more powerful than an ordinary array like this. Here is an ordinary array. A equal to four, five, seven, three. And I'm printing ordinary array. This is a very important concept I'm going to, uh, I'm focusing on. 
you see ordinary array so don't fool don't be fooled by the kind of appearance that hey this is also in a square bracket that is also in a square bracket what's the difference well what you see is it's only printing for convenience there is a lot more other things let's look at it what's it, what it is type first let's what type of thing is it in fact i'm going to type here uh, uh, i can type like this um, type there is a type function in python data and i'm going to put another new line let's look at it and then here i have done reshaping i don't know what i got i'm going to print it now type std matrix new line and this is type a okay there is a comma missing right so what did i get so it's a numpy array that's also numpy array it's still not in sci scipy scipy have its own matrix format or numpy even has matrix i think then this is a list arrays in python are called list so this is an ordinary list but they all look very innocently like an ordinary array okay so now what we have done is essentially reshape the data and printed it well there is another thing i want to show you is that in each of these cells there is suppose you were right type this as the matrix in jupyter notebook let me enter. let's see look at it what it says what happened here std matrix i did here std matrix i should call it std matrix std matrix it's a numpy array and it chose to print it in this way and when i just type here it showed me output so jupyter notebook has this property it's not about python it is just jupyter notebooks whatever variable you type last it prints whatever it can in its own way and i will explain what it mean by own way and if you put a semicolon it gets suppressed it's just a property just a trick okay so um yeah so these are coming out of the print statements not by default because i is the last thing okay um any question on that uh hi kishori oh yeah so regarding uh, this uh, uniform right so uh -huh. this package is uh, imported from scipy but still it is showing that uh, numpy dot array right uh, so yes so so uh, it is uh, it is an uh, inherited version of numpy the scipy uh -huh. package yes. okay uh, good question that is a very good question you need, you need this uh, background yeah so we have this is how the hierarchy is built we have at the bottom i think at the bottom we have python python is built with certain primitive types right array list is one of them list is just it has a few things length values that's all not too much too many things because these lists are two primitive things very simple it cannot do sophisticated functions everything you do you can achieve anything with that list but you will have to write a lot of code and every time you are writing a new code you'll have to do a lot of work so on python you are built with numpy numpy is has array looking things but it is it has a lot of other bells and whistles that make numerical calculation easy and scipy focuses on the actual methods of calculation techniques of math not just arrays so numpy still provides simple things like random number generator and stuff scipy is focused on only calculation the mathematics of it how to use this so numpy is built on this and scipy 
again builds on this. So that's why from the SciPy library, when you ask something, it uses NumPy under the hood because it's already done. It doesn't need to re-implement all of these arrays and matrices concepts. But you will see, it's still what you call matrix, it will still implement some functions. They will see that. Did it explain, uh, Sora? Yeah, yeah. So basically, SciPy is a mathematical implementation. And for this mathematical implementation, uh, NumPy provide a basic array and yes. all this data structure. Arrays, vectors, kind of stuff. Yes. yes. Yep. Okay, got it. So we are here. So now we are going to see what it is that um, I'm thinking that I want to mimic sparse matrix. Sparse matrices, as we define, are mostly zeros. Only some locations, the numbers are non-zero. And then we'll find a way to represent them. So let's take, do another interesting thing. Let me show you with 400 numbers this time, same random, but before that, how do I, I want to make like, maybe I don't know, 50% uh, of the numbers randomly zero, is it possible? So my goal is to why not anything less than one zero? Why don't we make it, create a matrix out of it like that? So, well, you know that we have done in a previous class that when you have a matrix or NumPy, you can do several kinds of index. One, you list locations or you send logical true, false, true, false. How do you get logical true, false, true, false location wise? You probably remember this. This is, gives you a true, false. Essentially, it's an array of true, false in the same format as the original. And then it, anything that is true, it will select those and then I'm going to assign them zero everywhere. Let's see what we get here. So this essentially selects all those numbers that are less than one. Because a true means it will select, false means it will not. So it becomes true if that value is less than one. I covered it in a previous class, but you should go back and play with this. This is a very powerful technique. Now I'm going to assign them to zero. I can even modify them right here on these values of that array. Right, and then I'm going to, after modifying, Let's see what happens. I modified them. Let's print it out again now. Let uh, me type STD. Here you go. All the numbers that were less than one, I made them zero. So it's kind of sparse in our world, right? So the idea of sparse matrices, you know, it's not because of theoretical interest because most real world matrices that are large are often sparse matrices. Or you can approximate it to sparse matrices so that you can do your calculations fast. And I'll explain that, why? Let's give you a visual representation. Is there any way to look at it? How sparse a matrix is, right? You can count, of course, how many are zeros, non-zeros, but I'll show you a nicer way. Let's generate again some data, uniform. This time I'm going to generate, say, I don't know, 400, say, to make the number larger. Again, zero and between zero and scale it by two. So essentially by default, it's zero and one. Scale means it, everything gets stressed out. So it becomes zero to two. There, I am going to now create a matrix right away by reshaping it. Reshape it the data, how do I want, maybe 20 by 20, it looks nicer, great. So then I'm going to make them zero for anything less than say 
So think about it. It's a ran okay, let me so the idea I'm I'm going to do is this. I have a matrix twenty by twenty. And each number is between uniform zero and one, uh, zero and two. If I have any number, the chances of it being between anywhere between zero and two is uniform, right? So think about 1.5 here. The chances of a number drawn randomly to being on the left side is three fourth. 75% because you know if you divide it into 0.5, 1 equal 4 parts, these 3 parts are the chances, these 3 parts represent anything less than 1.5. So if you random and it's uniform, only 25% will be larger than 1.5. And this is a very unfair thing I'm doing. I will correct it right away. Uh, I should draw larger. Zero and two. Point five, one point zero, one point five. So anything I draw randomly here, the chances of being less than one point five is three fourths. That is the probability. So three fourths of the numbers of the matrix will be zero. Right? And let's go and see that. How how do we make it like that? So the one way is, I just tried now, a few minutes ago. One point five anything, I want to make it zero. And what I want to show you is that can I plot it physically? There is a trick you can do actually. What you can do is that in matplotlib, there is a plotting library and you can use it to show plots on it. And how do I exactly do that? So what you import is this library called import. And these are standard libraries we have been using. Pyplot, we have been using it in the classes. As PLT, I like to call it PLT, short. And then I'm going to do is, I'm going to use this plot to plot sparse matrix. And it's called SPY. So this is given specifically to look into how dense a matrix is. SPY matrix. Something went wrong. Plot. Okay, this should be PLT. Uh, no, it's a uniform dot RBS, I think. Uh huh. Oh, say it again. Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, the random numbers we are generating, right? It's uniform dot RBS. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's all. Most of it. Uh, this is now next level of MAT. MATH. Uh, matplotlib, right, that's great. Okay, so now uh, what I was doing is that trying to plot it, right? Um, what happened to this now? Let's see. Why is it not plotting? It should plot something. Here you go, there. So you see these are 20, num 20 by 20, 400 cells. And I made many zero. Uh, I better do one thing so that I can make this. So in order to you know, create a cell above your cell, press escape and A. Then you can actually, we can paste it there. And we'll also use our random seed. Anything, it just needs to be fixed 
here. And I'm saved. So we have that. So we don't need this. Okay. Uh, right. So, so that we have see the same thing again and again. Great. So now if you make it 0.5, most of them would be. So essentially anything that is non-zero number is colored dark. Anything that is empty, that is zero, that means. So for example, if you make, you know, this is, it's going to make anything that is equal to thing zero. So of course it is not true. There is nothing that is exactly zero. So it did not care ammo. It left the numbers as it is. So it's just a way to, um, so or if you make everything zero, which is nearly two, say two, everything is going to be zero. You have nothing here. So this you can see the percentage, or I can create that 25% in another way. Uh, why don't I, um, yeah, 0.5. That's seventy-five percent of them are non-zero. So, so okay. So, in reality, you'll find that out of like say ten, only ten five percent are non-zero. So, what is the number I should put for to be five percent to be zero? So, most of them to be zero means essentially point nine uh, point. 1.8 is, uh, no, 1.8 is your 10%. So 90%. 90% are zero. Essentially, this is the amount of actual data you have. And often it is even more than that, even 95 even. Because it's a scale of zero to two, that's why it's 95 is. You see, only a few are numbers, rest are all zeros. Uh, let me print them. Here you go. Most of them are zeros. So we have created a sparse matrix. So essentially in the memory, you see you are storing a lot of bytes to store the same thing again and again, zero, 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 nothing, no use at all. You're just wasting memory, RAM. Slowly and doing calculations that do not need to be done if you are doing any operation on the matrix. Any questions so far? So let me show you another one. Okay, let me remove this long, annoying. Okay, great. So let's again, I'm going to carry that. There are other, actually, you can even create sparse distributions, random, but they are like randomly sparse. There is a function called sparse. We can actually import from SciPy. And, uh, and that, that's, that's also sometimes very useful to kind of see how it works. So I want to show you here, say for example, to imp import that from SciPy. Parse. So then we will use. Is there a question? Okay. No question. Okay. So now I'm going to generate a sparse matrix. You can also create random sparse matrix. Random. This is all going to be between zero and one. I'm going to create 10,000 by 10,000. Or maybe, uh, yeah. And out of them, only a few are going to be, density could be one, but it's very light density. And then I'm going to see how light this is. Uh, keep it small, marker sizes. Now look at this. That means 
if you were to store in a naive way, you would be using all this space. But if you are smart enough, you'll be only storing dots. So the areas are a lot fewer. Okay. So that is the idea of, a, you know, sparse matrices, this is how they look. Like images often have sparse matrices once you compress them. Because a lot of times you have the same color or empty, or you can make it uh, calibrate it so that it's mostly sparse. Uh, for example, if you are looking at a you know, sky, it's all blue. So there will be ways to make them zero by adjusting them and then make it sparse. Um, and many algorithms do this normalization. So after, you know, yeah. So any questions on this? Um, so we might take a five or six, five or six minutes break for people to digest and think. Then after this, uh, we will actually, I'm going to show you sparse matrix representations and continue. Any questions so far? Uh, so, yeah. Go. yeah, so can you showcase a real life example uh, where you use sparse matrix so it would make sense? Right, so the sparse matrix, one example is um, the recommendation system. So, um, Example I gave, consumer behavior. <clears throat> These are item numbers, one, two, three, up to say 20,000. <clears> and these are customer now IDs, one up to million, 10 to the power six, and Number, if customer one has bought five pairs of shoes of type one, well, it's five. If it is of say seven, da, da, da. if he bought, you know, three of these seven Nike, you know, brand shoes, will get three. Similarly, there will be one customer, which is say 2000. He bought something from product number 11, six pairs and product number 15, three pairs this so look at this out of 20,000 possible num 20,000 other than two all of them are zeros because these are a bunch of zeros everywhere zero similarly for other customers it's mostly zeros this would be a sparse if you were to plot you will see only here a square, right? The blue squares that show on the screen. See here only on this. There might be another here. Somewhere here. This is called item. Item and customer. And these are used in recommendation systems. This kind of things for recommending the right product to the right customer. Uh, is what do you think, Saurav? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we will take a five-minute break and then start. Now we understood what is sparse matrix. It is. Uh, we understood what we can do, uh, uh, we, we realize the problem. We have seen that it appears often in data science. How do we exploit it now? How do we use it? Uh, can we do something about it? What are the three methods or two methods? Uh, we need to understand them, the internal mechanics. And uh, the, you know, so let's take this five minutes break just to you know, realize that problem and think about it and also to drink water. See you next.
Neil, can you hear me? Yes, it's clear. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's get started with the first of the methods. With an example and a motivation. So as we know now, sparse matrices have mostly zeros. Let's take an example, simple example. I'm going to take a four by four matrix. Just keep it one, two, zero, zero, four, zero, 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 one, zero, three, zero, zero, one. Most of them are zero. If I were to store them all, it will take me 16 times four, four bytes, that many locations. So maybe I can do even better. Why don't I do in this? So the first one way is that why not store the location information that are non-zero? Now usually the trick about most sparse matrix representations, not sparse matrices. Representations means how you write a data structure in Python. Specific, it can be in any programming language, but we are concerned with Python, SciPy. Is that you want to store somehow the information related to the non-zero elements, and that's it in a compact way. One way is called coordinate representation. coordinate based sparse matrix coordinate based matrix format coordinate based matrix format can store any matrix but when you use to store in this format sparse matrices naturally the memory footprint is low and i'll explain why or we'll call it coo it's a pop you know, people call it coo matrix sparse matrix here is how it does it stores the location. This is 0, 1, 2, 3. These are the columns. 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay. And they don't have to be square. They don't have to have equal number of rows and columns. So here is how you do. This one, store the coordinates, row number and column number. 0, 0, I have 1 here. Then I have in the first row, column 1, 2 here. You always store them in any scan them in any order you like as long as you take care of all these non-zeros right four so that is one zero four that is two here two and two is one the next one is i don't need to have equality one then i need Three, zero, one, two, three, three, zero is three, three, one is one. That's it. All you store is this, rest is zero. That's what you think of it as. One way you could write like them is that you can have three arrays. Store three arrays like this. In the first row, stores these rows, this array. Right. The next one stores the corresponding columns and this stores the data. This could be negative numbers as well. So essentially, you need three arrays to store this information. Think about it. If you had a full matrix and say, then you would have 16 here, 16 here, 16 here. In fact, you might take more memory, but when you are talking about sparse matrices, this is probably not a very good example. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is 18 numbers where there are 16. This is essentially a 
uh, it does not show you in gain, but think about if there were 1 million here, in this case, 1 million or 10,000 by 10,000, 10,000, only 1,000 are non-zero elements, which is how sparse matrices are usually. Then instead of 10 to the power eight, because it's this many times that many numbers, if it's like 1,000 numbers, you'll store only three for each number. You have one representation, one element from that, one from the row, one from the column, one the value itself. Three times 1,000. Think about it, how many times it's smaller, 3,000? It's many, many times. This is 3, 10 to the power minus five. That is a tiny fraction, small fraction of it. You could do this. So this coordinate representation has an advantage. But now, the whole matrix we are used to talking as if like, as if like one variable. Now, I need to store three arrays just to represent one matrix because I have three components. What they created is called a class in Python that would be called CO matrix that have all of them hidden. And also I have to do something else more than that because I need to support plus minus and so on. Any questions before we get to the implementation and stuff? Uh, Kishori, I think uh, there's a little blurred on the camera. I think it's need to be focused a little more on the board. Okay. I think you probably need to kind of take it a little more near to the board or probably. I see. Okay, let me see. Let me see. Is it better? Yes, seems like it's a little better. Okay. Yes, it's better. Right, okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So let's go to some hands on. Okay, good. So far we have gotten here. So now we are going to do is uh, this call. This topic. coordinate matrix format. So what are the three uh, uh, main things it has? Uh, or some people call it also IGV format. You know, some people call it um, also call IJV format. Row, column, and values, that means, or triplet format. And we will look into the three components of it. So now, one of the advantages is that it, you can create from any other regular array, this matrix, or any other empty you can create, or one tuple at a time. It's very suitable to convert it into other forms of matrices. Also good at multiplication, very fast, because you don't need to worry about multiplying a zero with a number. It's going to be zero anyway. Uh, the disadvantage is that you cannot directly access a value because it's stored in three different rows. You have to rely on the methods provided by the you know, underlying class. So um, 
for example, I will uh, now create a CO matrix. I'll show you how to do that. Uh, but before, and it is a part of the sparse module. It's a part of the sparse module here. So let's create a sparse matrix. And it's very important just because I am typing and something, some results are coming on the screen. Do not look at it as like, oh, this is trivial. Uh, why is he not, you know, quickly just running through these examples? Well, that is more of a, you know, feeling of a movie. We like to, the action to take place fast and you do not understand anything and you don't care. This you have to care. Think about it and please ask questions. So I'm going to create now an empty uh, a matrix and then see how can I create a sparse matrix out of it. And I want to show you how it is represented under the hood. And then I want to show you, do you really save memory? Show me, prove it to me. You have to realize that, that is very important. Okay, any questions, let me know. So first, one way of creating a such a matrix, MTX, let's call it, ever in a, it's called sparse. I want to create a sparse matrix. A matrix always have to have a dimension, three by four here, I call it say. I'm going to create 12 numbers. And data type, it could be integers, floats, anything you want of this numeric. I have created one. Let's see what it is. So it didn't do anything. Uh, let me print it is what it is. Oops, MTX. We didn't print anything. There is nothing because. Okay, so what about if I just type like this? This is a sparse matrix of type NumPy class integer, okay, 8-bit integer, and with zero elements now stored, okay. So now that means there is nothing. Can I do this? No, it does not allow that. That is one of the drawbacks of the sparse matrices, that you cannot just, not all, specifically this coordinate matrix. It's simple, easy to understand, Easy to manipulate, but unfortunately, not so easy to directly assign, just to make sure you. So now what I'm going to do is make a matrix, NumPy matrix, full of fives, just five, three by four, same size. Full, it's called, this is the function. All say five, I put a value. And I'm going to print it for you. So that's what you get, three by four. And uh, let's keep revising it. So now I'm going to do is that MTX, I'm going to update this number in location two and three. You see, uh, now I'm going to print it again. Uh, the, I call it original, original standard matrix, I call it. Then after modification, um, matrix, after modification. Did it happen? Maybe invalid syntax somewhere, print, um, what happened? Invalid. It's a opening bracket. Oh, okay. Uh, sure, thank you. All right, see, I was able to change in place the element. Uh, third row, fourth column element I was able to change. So, do, so in the first one, when you are in the coordinate representation, you cannot do that. And that's the, that is an issue actually, that's a problem. Uh, you are not allowed to do that. 
So please, you know, pay these thing, pay attention to these things because when you really do these things, you will look at it like a simple matrix. Hey, I want to update it, and then you'd be frustrated, and then you'd like, oh, I hate these these kind of matrices. This is where the details are going to save you. Now I have this matrix. This is, I have created an empty matrix, and there is nothing yet here. And I created a full matrix, and I am. I'm able to modify. So now let's create, learn how to create a matrix from this data itself. Can we do that? Well, there is a way here you can do. Sparse matrix is not only for this sparks. This is a call a constructor, right? You provide parameters into it and it constructs one. There are other constructors where you can actually give the data. I call coordinate matrix, let's call it empty. Let's see what it prints. Nice. It did not print anything because I made a typo. Uh, what did it print? It printed this row and column and the value. So essentially, it chose to print in a very funny way as opposed to in a matrix form. This is the native native form. Let's type just, is that what it does? It didn't print anything. So it is not in your nice suitable square form. Here I just tried to print. It's able to print an array of array. Very easy. But here it didn't print anything. There is a reason for that. That is because the underlying representations is not in an array of array. What it has is, you have to look at, now let me take you to another world, the source code of the program. Source code, how do I get there? Um, so I'm going to, so I'm going to paste the, a link. I'm going to take a source code here. This is the source code of the CEO matrix. This is the class and it inherits from data matrix, min max some other matrix. This is the source code. These are the, you know, people who developed it. What do I have? This is the constructor, you see? It can be instantiated in many ways. With him matrix, other dense, uh, dense matrix means the regular matrix, not sparse. Or with another sparse matrix, or you give a, an empty matrix, which is what we did a few minutes ago. And, you know, data type is D. It's a meaningless data type. It doesn't know what it is. Uh, or you can give data and then the shape. So you can, data, this variable will contain the matrix values, the rows, and uh, things. So you have to provide three things here. You can provide the data, rows, and column values for the non-zero elements. Rest will be all zero. Here you see, this is how it is. So, so essentially three arrays, i, j, k. And what are the attributes? What variable does it have? See, data. This is an array that stores the data. This is an array that stores the rows. So the fifth, for example, the i for example, sixth location of data corresponds to the same some number whose coordinates are row coordinate is in the sixth location of the row array, whose column coordinate is in the sixth position of the column coordinate. That's how it is uh, represented under the hood. And we'll print it out. And you see what it says, it fast conversion among fast, uh, it is very quick to convert from one sparse matrix to another if you are in CUO format. It's kind of the central uh, go-to format that you can convert from one to another quickly. And it can go to other formats too, very fast. And it allows duplicate entries, that's fine. Then um, 
it's also easy. All you need to do is somehow get the rows and a row array, column array, and the values. You can easily create. Then you don't have to manually write code to convert yourself, taking hours and hours. You can do it quick. So these are examples given few how to do that. Let's look at it. This is how you initialize, you see. Under the hood, when you give the data, it essentially allocates inside the Python class, row, column, data. You see it's using NumPy, it's using an empty array initially. Then I want to see where you essentially send the data, how it's going to store. Ah, here. If you have the first argument, the data, then it's going to copy the rows, copy the columns that are coming from you. So this is, I'm looking at the, you know, in it, uh, main constructor type, constructor essentially. That in it is the, you know, the constructor. It starts from here. It checks each instance, what type it is. Is it a tuple or not? And accordingly, depending on what kind of value you give here, you see, you might provide this, uh, this format. You can write a matrix or a tuple. So that's how it adjusts automatically inside the code, uh, depending on, that's why there is the if. If it is this, otherwise if not, I do this, else I copy like this. So this is it. This can, you see the reshape, you can reshape it by changing the rows and columns. Uh, there are a few formats. Of course, I'm looking at the source code. I have to look at the API. The way to learn how to use it is not prompting. You look, look at the API here. Uh, this is another kind of matrix. You want to go to the, you know, sparse dial CSR, let's see. You want to go to CO matrix. Maybe there is a one. Oh no. The diagonal matrix. So you have to look at the corresponding one. So CSR matrix. Um, let's see. Sparse. Here. Sparse matrix. You see, there are several sparse matrices. Sparse matrices have also some functions, useful functions. This is the API guide you should look at. How to use it. How do you do a, you know, product? vector product in sparse matrices, so on. But let's focus on this CO matrix. This is what you should be looking at to understand how to use it. See, it shows, yeah, essentially all of that that's written there, it's showing up here in the code. Uh, intended use, does it show up here? Right, example, you see, these are essentially high, high, pulling, these are doc strings, these are called. These are automatically, I think, created. Documentation is created from these automatically. Um, that's how they write these Python libraries. So what else? Reshape you can do. Get and another, you know, type, count. There are many functions. Check, these are internal. Anything that you see underscore, usually it's for internal calculations. You don't have to have access to it. Transpose. Transposing a matrix, I'll tell you of what it is. To array, you may want an array, plain array, you do not care the data. So you can call this function, convert it to other formats, which I will show you to this format. Also convert to other, a same format, to diagonal format, another format. You see to diagonal base key based format, then what other format? So essentially, eliminate zeros. Uh, these are just, uh, when you end, end up put data, it automatically eliminates the zeros. Multiply, multiply factors. Um, is it of this matrix type? Just to check, yeah. So you see this, this is how this is implemented. That's all, this 600 lines. Of course, there are other supporting libraries. And uh, this is how you can implement your own if you want to. But you have to know how to implement 
uh, these functions. And that's what we were looking at. So we saw under the hood here, under the hood that there is a data here, attributes right here. Attributes are what, these are variables in the instance. One is called data, one is called row, one is called column. Ah, and this is called number of non-zero elements. Okay, can I directly access it? Python does not have any, Python in a class, all the variables can be accessed directly. Unlike Java or C++, you cannot access private. So let's access directly under the hood. Let's Right, uh, let's see. Now that we have created this simple matrix, it's not sparse, but we are using sparse representation. So sparse, being sparse is a property, and representation is just a matrix. You can store anything non-sparse too, except it's not memory efficient. Let's look at what we have done so far. MTX, CEO, data, do I have anything? Yes, this is the data, you see? MTX, CO, NNZ or something you saw? 12. Yeah, that's about right, three times 12. Uh, can one be, can I make one of them zero maybe? We'll see how we can do that. MTX, uh, MTX, CO, rows. These are columns, these are the columns of them. MTX, row these are the row so let's play this game let's change this second rows third five into four say so second row this is two uh no one two okay one row one column two change the value to five and its position is what in the here what is the position here this is how you count, non-zero elements you count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven position. Well, let's count from zero, then it's six. So we have to change the sixth element of each of them to reflect that. All right, let's do that. Because Python has no private thing, then we'll, and this is just a regular array, sure. First, I'm going to change the column, six position, as that column is, oh, actually, I don't need to change the coordinate. I just directly change the value. Um, three, six position. Coordinate is coordinate. Anyway, I'm not going to make it zero here. Great. So now, let's print the x, But now there is a problem here. This is, after I convert it, there is no way to nicely print it. It prints this ugly form. Let me show you this. I don't want it. One function that we know is to make it a regular array, regular matrix. And in fact, we saw a function that converts it on the fly for you to array, see? There is a function called two array. It will print it nicely. Two array essentially, what does it do? Prints it out nicely. I think it uses Fortran under the hood. But sure, we will print it like that to array. It prints out nicely. There you go. So we have made it three. What if I make something? The first one, the, this last seven, uh, as zero, <clears throat> you'll see that number will become 11. And this, oh, that will, nothing will happen. You'll see, we'll abuse it. And it will, I think get, I think it should, it will get corrupt unless it has a check uh, internally that, hey, he changed it because zero has to be removed, right? You do not store <clears throat> in this data element zero. What if I make it zero? What happens? I don't know. I'm just being mischievous things. 
So that is position number 11, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. MTX, CO. My guess is if it changes and nicely behaves, <clears throat> if it still has the zero, then we will know that because we bypassed the system, it did not adjust. But if it's nice, then we would know that every time we print, there is a check function that goes in and that will actually correct it. I saw a check function here, a zero function. Uh, function somewhere, check zero somewhere. Um, zero, zero elements are removed. Add dense, eliminate zeros. We have to see who calls eliminate zeros here. Oh, we have to call this if we do directly. Uh, okay. So now uh, that, that's what we have to do. Otherwise, it will not be useful. 11 is equal to zero. Now let's print again. There is a zero. You see, because we bypassed it, we did not create it nicely. Now we want to do eliminate zero. This is just a, I'm playing around. Uh, hopefully it eliminated the zeros. Now we should see instead of, um, we should see the same matrix. Nothing should have changed with the zero. Um, great. Now we should see here when we do NPZ, it should be 11 this time. If you do not eliminate, it will still show it will not show actually, it will count uh, 11. Uh, and then the last position is eliminated now also. I didn't show. Um, so this is the internal inside of CEO matrix. And I want to show you another thing here. I want to transpose it. How do I do transposing a matrix? Uh, let's go and make one element directly so you see that if you want to directly change it, you have to work somewhat harder. Let's make it say 17 port. I hope it's not on a diagonal. Uh, this doesn't matter because it's a non-zero. And let's print again. All right, so 17. So transposing a matrix means what? You change the rows into columns, columns into rows. The values go into that. 17 will go to, it gets opposite. Opposite corner it will get. And the matrix, because it's a three by four matrix, it will become a four by three matrix. And now here is what it would look like. Print, MTX, CO. I will show you something before that. Um, print MTX CO. Then I'm going to show X. Then I'm going to show that transpose how it looks. Transpose matrix. What does transpose mean here? Essentially, you've changed the rows into column, column index into row. That's the meaning in the math, right? Uh, is there a transpose here? All you need to do is switch. I want to show you that. Um, this is important. Here, transpose, what does it do? It doesn't do anything, simply switches. Always first row, right? So all it does is creates itself, returns, creates another one, where this time, instead of column, it switched the rows into columns. Look at the definition of this. It expects you to send rows and columns. Now you just switched it. See row indices. But all he did is that he switched the 
the code in the code what they do is create another matrix instead of column if you put here row itself then it will be the same matrix but here they switch and instead of m and n now shape is changed that's all they did so now let's look at it you see this is the transpose matrix 3 0 0 3 17 is here anyway we know that definition of matrix from mathematics that it's like uh, transpose is essentially this if a is a matrix then we know that transpose is i comma j um, We know this formula, right? If you transpose, the things get um, inverted. That's all, essentially. So I was able to transpose it. So now this is, so transposing and all, you don't have to yourself write this code and it will do it fast for you quickly. And now I want to show you how to create from array and all and then i want to also show you what to do how to do uh, different multi operations matrix multiplications then i want to show you how much space you save any questions so far neil can you hear me yes it's good yeah i'm trying to understand it hi kishore yes go ahead so when you use the eliminate zero function uh -huh. And after it, you print it, uh -huh. but as a while you're projecting into the screen, right? It is still showing the zero. Uh -huh. So instead of that, uh, is it any other value it will print, like negative something? Because zero is not expected, right? We are eliminating zero. Right. But so projecting um, showing zero. other values are not eliminated because sparse matrix, the idea is zero versus non zero. Mm -hmm. uh, you could if you say that hey i don't want negative numbers you can do operations to remove it but negative numbers will not save you any memory no no uh, just uh, as a placeholder because uh, once you delete uh, the zero values right uh huh so after you print that matrix it's still showing that zero is there so from viewing perspective uh, we thought that it is not deleted right, right? Oh, so, I see. Yes, yes. Yeah. Can we right. set any other value instead of zero? Right. Uh, that. Oh, okay. So it will. It will. Okay. I see your point. Let's do that experiment. Let's do an experiment now. Um, let's start by printing. Um, say, I want to make another value. Third value, 100, okay. It didn't do anything. And also let's look at the source code quickly. See if there was a way, maybe I wanted to remove something, right? As you said, uh, none other, non-zero values. You see here, the mask is created only based on whether it is zero or not. It's non-zero, not no other choice. So, yeah. So you don't have a choice. But can we do overloading of this function here? You could overload it. Then you have to kind of implement yourselves. 
Like I can actually take this whole class and then copy it, the entire thing, uh, but you can otherwise cannot overload it. You have to uh, add a new function called remove such things. Also, when you remove something, make sure that you, uh, how do you do that? Yes, let me see. You can overload it, yes. All you need to do is that remove all those elements of a particular value and adjust the rows and columns though. You have to make sure that you adjust the rows and columns after eliminating them. You yes, might. you can do that. Uh, but you have to write your own function. Got it. Yeah, and actually what I'm going to show you now is exactly going to show you something very close. That how do you supply the data from outside? How do you play essentially supply that data so that it directly goes into it. Essentially you supply three arrays, column indices, row indices and data, and then somehow, and you create it. Which would mean that we are going to use this constructor. So yeah, to note that if you are doing other programming language, Java or C++, here, you are you have essentially one function. Overloading is done with based on uh, your arguments, what arguments you put. It's just one, there is no really over in C or C++ you'll write different, actually not C, C++ and Java, you'll write different constructors explicitly, different functions. Here it's just one in it and inside and using these optional arguments, you are playing games here. You are adjusting, if this is this, then I'm going to take these guys. That's how you are achieving this um, polymorphic constructor. That's something interesting to note. So now let's start, how do we create exactly values from three rows? I'm going to create a CEO matrix, row index, um, I'm going to say it has to be NP array. I mean, you can give non NP array, but use there. Just creating some random one row, this column index IND equal to NP array. Zero, two, four, four, three, four. Remember, they have to be of the same length. They cannot be data also. Same length. NP. One, two, three, four, minus five. We are tired of positive numbers. That's great. We have created three arrays. Now I'm going to create matrix. Yo, how sparse. CO matrix. I'm providing the data two tuples, tuple of tuple again. A pair, right? A pair data, and there will be another pair. pair. One pair, one of the elements of the pair is itself a pair. Row index, I'm just sending that right here. And um, I should also, it is good to tell the data type. You can maybe float so that I can see decimals. Tired of ordinary, you know, integer say. Uh, this is a, what I have created. Let's see what we get. This is what I get. And let's print it in a nicer form. That's what we got. Um, this is how you can explicitly create. So for example, if I want to eliminate anything that is zero, uh, anything that is four, I can eliminate them uh, in these arrays right away in advance uh, by iterating through them and then again creating. That's one way you can create. Um, yes, 
Any question? Okay, so now I want to show you something interesting here. Do arrays great to dense, right? Sp opposite of sparse is dense format, like you don't care to. To dance, same thing looks like, right? It just gives me what I did before. Uh, also, let's remove, make it integer. It looks cleaner. These decimals are harder. And we create it again, create it again, create it again. Yeah, this is great. So, I am printing this uh, dense and array. So they both seem to kind of convert it back from this compressed format to dense, regular format. Can I do multiplication, array multiplication? Maybe I can do that, it's okay. Uh, I can store in a variable and then do, you know, dense multi multiply two guys. Let's see what I get. Print, there is an interesting thing you'll see. Array point wise mouth mouth is so you got a number. So what you essentially got is a new matrix, the product. So that means this star operator, somehow it knows how to deal with these matrices. That's very important, first thing. Uh, then let me again print another thing right after that. Print. And you'll see something surprising, and that is going to tell you what to dance. Okay, so I like to put, I should put this really new line. Right, uh, the results are here, okay. Okay, so now you see how I have created the two, you know, uh, different ways. But if you look carefully, there is an issue with this number. It's supposed to be minus 15, it has become something strange. Um, what do you think is the reason? Yeah, minus 15. Well, let's look a little closer. What it is that we are looking at here. So first, I'm going to examine, there is an issue here. So let's look at the number itself. So multiply here, what is happening here? Two array times two array. So one times one is one, zero times zero is zero, all is good, two becomes four, three becomes nine, three squared, because it's multiplying point wise. Four becomes 16, and five minus five becomes 25. On the other hand, this is matrix multiplication when you do dense. So then does it mean that this and these are two different things? How come with this star operator, they behave differently? Let's examine. When you get confused like this, do this thing, print. Always check the type, type, Two dense, right? Like say two dense print two array. Let's see what we get. Oh. So the dense is a matrix from NumPy and uh, to array is an array of array. Okay, so let me now go to the board and show you something.
So what happened is that when you did that matrix, let's call it A, A to array, it created a NumPy array. NumPy array. It is a different object. It stores a matrix that is great. When I did the multiplication, the star, the results here became whatever it is. Of course, I use the same one squared, but let's say they were different. Uh, A1, B1, A2, B2, and so on. D3, or uh, D1. Whatever, whatever, F3. Uh, no, A, B. I will call it A10. A12, I'll call it B. I don't know, B10, say somewhere. B12, the corresponding elements. It just gets here, A1 times B1. And the other one would be A2 times B2. Similarly, that are, it's all correspondence. So this you get by, uh, this gets by, you multiply these two, the corresponding elements. That's the you are getting. Similarly, to get this number, you are essentially multiplying whatever sits here, A10, A10 times, B10, these two multiplying, you are multiplying. On the other hand, when you do matrix, on the other hand, when you do two dense, this is what you do. Two dense, it's a NumPy matrix The way you get this element, this element is not true pointwise element. This one you'd get this row, whatever you call it, A1 true, A n. If you look at it B, say this is matrix B, this you get B, uh, let's call it A1, 1, A1, n. And this would be B11 through BN1 because it's vertically. So this element would be this here, let's call it C11 would be essentially this matrix multiplication. K equal to one to N, A, so it's the same row, right? One and it's K, B, K, one. This is what you do. Or C, I, J, any element C i j would be here, uh, k equal to one, n, a, i, k, b, k, j. Whereas above, you have here the above, the C, C i j would be simply a i j times b i j, pointwise multiplication. That's why you are getting different results. So you have to be careful what you are converting into. Now, how come, next question comes, just because I have two different NumPy arrays, NumPy matrix, how come this star is so smart to know that? That's the next question we are going to, I'm going to tell you something about Python. So in the meantime, is there any question you have? Okay, so let me invest, show you how this is being achieved. But this, you have to be very careful. Uh, and uh, this is where, as engineers, you know something more detail or like, hey, what's going on so that you know actually. Right. Let's first look at space saving. And I'm going to go for tell you about operator overloading in Python. Space savings now. Do you really save space? So, um,
space savings. Um, so what I'm going to do is that create a bunch of sparse matrices and then show you how you can store uh, the same data in two different ways and look at the memory savings. Okay, so first I do NP random seed so that I use the same thing. Seed data equal to uniform Yes. So again, I'm taking uniform values between zero to two uniform, and then I'm going to reshape as same variable I'm going to override. Uh, one say uh, make it million one million reshape this data and then I have to provide the data and comma and then I have to provide it this this is the data I have created and I'm going to create data um, Anything, 50% of them, I'm going to make them zero. Or maybe actually more than that. 1.5% uh, of, 75% oh, um, of them are going to be zeros, as we showed before. Um, and I'm going to make it zero. Then I want to calculate what's the size of the data. Data size in the data. N bytes is the function for any matrix, N pi matrix, N bytes divided by four, that is kilobyte square megabytes. In megabytes, I care about. So then I'm going to print it here, print size of full matrix or the dense matrix with zeros. And I'm going to print up to the second decimal place. This is the format, 2F means within this curly bracket means you will provide something and this is the format. So, and then dot immediately after the string format, how do you want to format it? Data size. Seven point six three MB. That many. So now what happens if we make it a sparse matrix. So in order to create the sparse matrix, the same matrix data CSR, uh, data CSR size is equal to data CSR. They have a different function called data dot size. four, two, that's the way to go. This is the one we do. And then we have to multiply it by three because there are three rays. data size. And then now you say, uh, print size, size of, size of sparse TSR matrix dot two F. format data point seven two MB so ten times less memory but the same matrix but substantially smaller than the original data so that's how much memory you save in the RAM 10 times for this. So this is the advantage of the sparse matrix representations. So now 
I have actually silently shown you that. Yeah, any questions? Uh, hi, Kishori. Yes, go ahead. So why we use three here, three into data CSR? Oh, three, because we have three, uh, we know that in our representation, we have three uh, arrays, right? Data, rows, and columns. We have to count also the oh, rows okay. as well, and rows and column indices as well. Right, right. Uh, because, yeah, they also need space, yeah. Uh, Neil, any question? Uh, no. Can, uh, okay. Can you, uh, you can see, okay. Uh, is it too slow, too fast? Are, are the concepts being, um, you know, communicated clearly? Are you able to understand it? Uh, yes, uh, it's fine. Uh, yeah, the internals are very important here. So, okay. Okay, Kishori. Uh, yes. Uh, for size, uh, here we had used in the first thing we have used data dot n bytes. Uh -huh. So n bytes is an attribute of uh, uh, attribute SciPy. of arrays. Attribute of arrays of SciPy. Yes. Uh, NumPy. NumPy. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, for the other thing, it we have used data dot size. So that is for sparse sparse metrics mm -hmm. that is for scipy right uh the data dot size is for the regular matrix in numpy okay normal matrix in numpy uh that is um, here this is uh see this one simply returns us a straightforward matrix uh let's look at it let's look at that first uh, make sure that we understand data type. See, it's a NumPy ND array. It's not even matrix, it's just an array of arrays. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at data coup of how we are storing type. See, it's a this type matrix. Uh, and inside there, we know that they always store the data in a data thing, uh, data variable. Let's look at it, type of that. Data, CO, I know that we just examined in the, under the hood that there is a, ah, so this is NumPy array, you see? Because it's NumPy array, I could use here uh, directly and bytes as well. See, it's just num by uh, n bytes, yes. So now the question is, what happened here? So there are the number of bytes in the data queue we have. Okay, let's see. But yeah, we'll in investigate this. There, there could be something uh, funny things here. Oh, and, and this is the thing. So, but idea is to go inside that data. I know why it is a uh, thing. Uh, because n bytes here, it's a number of bytes. That's also number of bytes. Uh, there was a, a missing factor here. So here, if we look at size, are you there, um, Kashabi? Oh, uh, yes, I'm there. An interesting problem here. You see, this is essentially, uh, we did not expect the space to be that eliminated. We want, we see about three fourths of them should reduce, right? Become zero. Some are already zero. So it should not decrease too much. So when I did size, it essentially gives you the number actually. But each of them should take about First of all, there are about four bytes, right? Par numbers probably, that's one. And secondly, there are three of them, three arrays. 
So that brings us to that. Or this is a, depending on how Python stores, or maybe it stores even um, eight bytes in, on the integer. So that depends. So that you have to be careful about, careful of what format you are choosing. So n bytes will give you in n bytes, size will give you the number of elements. And each element is a number which may have several bytes. Okay. Okay, yeah. so n bytes is uh, number of bytes and size is number of elements. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but when you do the size of the number of elements, somehow you have to know how many bytes is in each element. And yeah. also, uh, depending on the format, float or integer, it's different, right? I usually say, for example, in C, uh, when you do, it's like four bytes. For floats, for long, it's eight bytes. But here, Python, it, it, it's hard to tell. We have to do some more analysis. How many bytes they store in a float or an integer? Okay, so this is how you can see that you are saving space. And this is essentially three fourths of the time. It's actually, you know, zero. But in practice, in sparse matrices like the one we saw for recommendation system, it is only like what percent is non zero, like 0 0.00001, like that percentage. It's almost like that many, very few non-zero elements. You know, one out of 10,000 values is non-zero. Most of them are zero in real life applications. Uh, so that's, so it, it is a standard like a technique you will be using in these sparse matrices and you should use it when you need to do the calculations. So yeah, um, great. So um, next, I want to show you some more, uh, what I want to show you, space saving I want to show you. Ah, yeah. So shall we take a five minute break and I'm going to show you under the hood, we'll spend the rest on some details about Python that you should know. How are these operators overloaded? Why are they working? What if you wanted to create your own style of, you know, uh, sparse matrix, vectors, some kind of fancy things? How would you do that? And that will teach us two things, how to create Python classes that can overload operators. So then, uh, do you have any questions in the meantime, before we take a break, five minute break? Okay, so we'll meet in five minutes then.
Neil, can you hear me? Neil? Yes, it's good. Okay, good. Okay, I'll... It, yeah, it's, yes, it's good. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let's <clears throat> discuss one more topic before we go there. Uh, there is another method. There is, uh, okay. Com uh, hmm. Okay. There are two other methods that are very uh, um, of sparse matrix representation that are popular that you should know. Please ask me questions whenever you get confused. Anytime you can stop me. Okay, so we have seen COO, coordinate representation. What about other forms of representations? There are two others. One is called CSR, compressed sparse row form, and CSC, compressed sparse column. They are almost similar except one minor difference. So let me explain you how you can do um, represent it. So let's take a matrix again. Again, sparse matrix is, so let's take a matrix, two, four, zero, three, a uh, two, three, zero, zero, zero. This one. Column zero, one, two, row zero, one, two. Okay. There are another way of representing. First of all, let's represent the data that are non zero data. As you scan it always like this. Say here in this form, two, four, one, two, two, three. So now we know that these are indexed from zero, one, two, three, four, five, five of them, six of them actually. This and this belongs to row one. No, here. These two belong to row two. This is row three. So what I want to store is that I have the data, no problem, and they are in the right order. What I want to create, another one is called INDPTR, another. It has also three arrays, but in a different way. It stores, it marks from where to where it's about the first row, from where to where it's about the second row, third row. So what here, it's from zero, till three, always the right side is ignored index. So zero, three, index pointer. That means from this here to here, of course, ex excluding the right hand side, it's about the first row. Then from these two, three to four, essentially five, three, four, five, it's always right hand side excluded, okay? This is a symbol, say, I can use. This is about row one. From here, this is included square up to five. This is row two. This is row one. And from five onwards, you can call it six, although it doesn't exist. Five to six, because right is ex excluded R3. So all it says from first row is from zero, one, two, three. 0, 1, 2, 3 is excluded. This is about the non-zero elements in the first row. 3, 4, 5, they are about the second row and third row. So you take pair, pair like this. So that means there are as many elements uh, plus one as there are number of rows. 
So you have the data, you know, at least you can tell which row what data is by looking at here. Now we need to fix the columns. Indices it's called. Indices are exactly telling you which data element, what column number it is in, in its corresponding row. For example, two. Two is in first row, we know that, because it says so. Zero through three, zero, one, two, this index, this is a part of first row. Which column does it occupy? Zero, zero. What about four? One. What about one here? I know it's in first row, but the column itself is in hard column. Zero, one, two, zero, one, two, three, yeah. These are the columns. So what about two here? This corresponds to this two, and it's about second row. That's this guy's problem, I don't care. I want to fix the index. Two, that is zero. What about the other two? Zero, one, two, three. This is also, so this I know from here to here is first row one because of this, row two because of this. And whatever is left, three, three should be in zero. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, that corresponds to the number of rows. So as CSR format has, instead of the COO, let's contrast it with COO. What is the difference? COO also has the data, no problem. It has the same data, but it has, instead of this complex representation, row and column arrays. That's different. That explicitly tells us the coordinates. Here it has this row, uh, the rows are compacted. So this is always fixed. So in fact, think about it, which one will give us more saving? The more saving, it's not going to come from data. So this is the same space it takes in both methods. Number of rows. Here, this is equal to the number of rows. But here it's equal to the number of non-zero elements that could be more than the rows, depends on the data or problem you are solving. So this will be small and this will be small. So for really sparse, this is not a bad method. If the number of non-zero elements is even smaller than your um, rows, then you will gain here. It will do even better because some are really sparse. Any question on this? So what we are going to do now is create a bunch of CSR format matrix. One other thing I want to tell you is that it's really suitable for getting the entire slice of the row here. Entire slice of the row because they are right next to each other. And in computer, there is this concept of temporal and spatial locality of data. So it will improve cache hits for certain operations such as multiplication and I'll give you a demonstration. Okay, so how do we create a sparse matrix, a CSR matrix? Now, what do we do? Well, this also has a very similar interface or, or constructor, let's see, again, data, uniform, RVS, the size, I'm going to take 64, 64 values. And this time I'm going to generate the uniform number between zero to five, zero. So then I'm going to store that data, I call it reshape it. data, I'll save it as, I don't know, eight by eight. Eight by eight. Then data, anything less than four, means 80% of them, I'm gonna make it zero. 
as you have seen the trick already, zero. Now that I have this data, let's print this data. Whole bunch of zeros, you'll see. Some are non-zeros, but most of them are zeros. I'm going to create a CSR matrix. SR matrix. R, this is called CSR, not CO. Um, data. And now I can print the data CSR. Let's see what it prints. Well, it prints the same as CO format code in it, but internal representation is different. You'll see that it has this called data. It's an array. It's just an array. Let's look at the size of the data array. Length. Uh, data. Uh, or length. I would say length of data array. How many are there? Right. CSR data, okay. CSR length, next step, look at here. Right, so 25, 250,000. So what about in pointer? PR, right, that's a array. Ah, okay. Uh, ID pointer, ID PTR, I think. Oh, I do not know actually. I'll find out. Print. Uh, indices, where the indices are. Great. So we do not know what's in pointer should be. Ah, okay. Data CSR. Oh, okay. So here is the mistake. CSR map. That's what I named it as. CSR map. Okay. So, 64 essentially, that's a different matrix I was accessing from before. So it's out of 64, see in a scale of zero to five, 80% were gone, right? We were expecting 80% to be non-zero because anything less than four, and it's between zero and five, it's uniform. So 80% we made zero. So 12 of them are, that this is our data. <clears throat> and uh, let me show you the data. And these are the indices. Here is the data and here are the indices. But what about in pointer? That should be the equal to the number of rows we have, right? Well, I don't know. IND PTR probably. It is. Okay, that's IND nine of them. Because you see there are eight by four, that there is always one plus for the rows. So that's what you get. That's what you are seeing. Let's print them out. So here, if the number of zero sparse matrices are really small, then it will, this will become shorter. Let me show you again, 4.5, increase the, reduce the number of non-zeros, seven, Data element also decreased, but this in pointer does not decrease because it has to relate to the number of rows here. Actually, um, I was a little confused. So when will this benefit compared to the CEO? So if the number of elements are really, really small, that in PT, PTR, in PTR, you will still pay this price. 
it, it will, you will still pay this price number of rows. Think about it like maybe 4.9. This is shrinking, but this will not shrink. But our CO matrix will start shrinking into 3.3, three, but this is stubborn. So you cannot reduce beyond a point the number of rows in CSR matrices. So any questions on, on this? Maybe I can see visually. Right here, I'm able to see visually. These are the non zeros, very few. So that is about sparse matrix. And there is another matrix that I'm going to tell you about. Ah, no, let me show you something more, a little more, how you can create these matrices. Um, how else do you create? We have previously, we have provided rows, columns, and data. Here also you can do the same thing, but it does not internally represent that way, but it can. So you can do still create, it using this data row column like in CO matrix. Here is an example. Two, uh, two, two. Here is one, and I'll do column. Okay. another and I can have my data here. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I can do, sorry. Sparse, CS, SR. CFR matrix and I can provide data, row and column. They have to match the numbers. So real column and shape also I'm asking it. So that's just an array of things. I have to tell them what shape because it's a matrix. Shape, you have to add the symbols. Great. So let's see where the error is. So there is a one extra parenthesis looks like. Right. CSR matrix sparse. Okay, here one. Here is the one. Data column up to here. Uh, shape. Okay, so now let's print it uh, as a dense CSR. This also you can do the same thing to dense. You can switch it to CO matrix. You can also do CEO matrix like, of course, uh, there you have this, um, here is a proof. You don't have, you do not have row here. You created it using row, but doesn't mean that you have it. But when you convert it into to CSR, a CEO matrix, the other form, now you can have your row. You can have your row. So you can convert from one format to another, actually. So that's the CSR matrix you can create with that. So now I'm going to explain what other way you can solve, uh, what other way. CSC is another, that's compressed sparse column. The only difference here is that it will be scanned from column wise. So your data here in CSR, CSC, it will be somewhat different. CSC will be, your data will be data two, two, three, four, 
one, two. They got reordered. It's the same elements, num but the order is different. The in pointer would be different in this way now. So zero, one, two, three. So zero, three, at three it ends. Three is a different line. Three to four, a three up to here. Uh, yeah, oh no. No, zero, one, two, three. Zero, one, two, three. Yeah, that's good. It's four, three, four. I'm here, four. Four, five, six. Okay, four. Uh, there is nothing here. Four is after four. Zero, one, two, three. Three to four. Four to four. There is nothing. That's what it means, four to four. Four, five, six. Seven, so it will be like this. And then you will have data. We have to check carefully here. And indices will be, it's an index from the top. So here it will be zero, one, two, zero, one, two. This is zero, four is, that is zero, and that is one. So it just formatted in a, uh, like in transpose form. Scanning. And this has its advantages, mostly for memory optimization. Uh, it, how you get the cache hits. It will be useful for certain operations like multiplications, matrix multiplications. Any questions on that? Okay. So now uh, we want to get back to some Python. How you can overload operators. That, this is very useful for you to know. All right. Great. Okay, so now I want to show you something interesting about Python, the operator overloading <clears throat> stuff. This is how did we implement, how does the star behave differently with different objects? Okay. So suppose we want to define a class, okay? So we can actually twist the definitions of anything we want in uh, overloading, when we are overloading. So I want to show you something. Suppose I define a class, class A in Python. That's how you define a new class A. This is your init is your underscore underscore init is your constructor. Self is always there. A, so you send some value and you store locally. Self, there is a local class variable that you always do self and store it there. Now, what I want to do is that these objects, whatever it is, I can instantiate, right? So let's see here. I create an object called obj A with one, all it stores one. So this is colon is missing. Sure, can we print anything? Can we type print type a uh, obj one? Yeah, so obj, sorry, obj. So it is essentially a class of type a. That's what I define. Nice, so I will define one more. That is good, so I want to print out. Also, it's same thing, it will be type, but then I want to print something obj1, obj1.a, because there is a value called a. That's one in the first guy. What about in the second guy? obj2a, two. 
So let's, that's all it stores. Can I do this? OBJ2 equal to OBJ1 plus OBJ2, maybe a three. Maybe I can do that, add them. All they store inside a number. What does it say? Unsupported operation. It doesn't make, make sense, it says. Between two objects of, of uh, instances, or instances of class A, no supporting links. But let's put this here. A, A, and first of course I have to create an object OBJ3, A4, say, A3, and I put here. I can run that, that seems fine. But then OBJ3 is what? It stores three. So that means if I have a class and I instantiate, although all the, all the class does is it stores a number. That's all it does. I could create them and I could see them, but I can directly add the numbers by explicitly referencing inside and add it. And already created stored object, I can update it. But what I cannot do is directly add these two objects. I would really, really like to define this operation to be more generalizable. What it should do is that I would put simply this. I would like to write like this. Or obj1 plus obj2. So what it will do for me is that it will create a new object and it will, um, you know, it will create a new object and then give me the new object. I'll do operations like this. That's all I want, addition of that. And uh, which I cannot get now. See, it's error. So what I'm going to do is that define a new function here. And these are special functions. This is for overloading the add, ADD. If you have defined this function, self, Another new object comes in right hand side because when you use this operator, you have always something plus something plus some other, right? This is what you are doing there. One thing this. So look at this as a, like a function, as if this is equal to saying that there is a function name, function name plus which takes two guys, some and some other, as if this is a function. It just happens to be an operator, but it's a function, plus operation. So anyhow, so that's more than, so I'm going to create a new object. So here I'm going to say return self a plus o dot a, it just simply add it and creates a sense a new object back. Will it work? Work this time, see? What did it return? Print. It created a number. It was able to create a number. In fact, we can do better perhaps can send it maybe like this maybe then you are essentially creating an object itself with this and sending the object back so this is how you can actually overload it different operators so it could be something else maybe subtraction doesn't mean subtraction something else I can say that actually I do multiplication let's print the object value here Two, maybe it's actually raised to the power of this one. So what did I do? Uh, object one is one, object two is this, or one raised to the power one is the same thing. Or maybe I just add 10 to it, the result. Uh, 
21. So this is how when you define this NumPy matrix class, you can actually overload all of these informations. So that's what uh, you can do. So uh, this is an important thing. So you can do plus multiplication, all these operations, you can binary operations, you can overload them. This is something I'll give home assignment on. Uh, it's very useful thing to know how the Python works. And then, and you can define it this on anything. And you can even overload the greater than, less than, you can redefine them. And that's very important. Um, any questions? Maybe I think we should take the remaining time to discuss about the materials we discussed in detail, if you have any, uh, or questions on this. Neil, any questions and all? Okay. Um, so if you have any question, feel free to ask. Maybe we can, I can answer some questions that you have doubts. And then um, otherwise we'll uh, pick up from next class. Well, uh, well, if there is no other question, then why don't we again pick up from next class? Okay, fine then. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.